Hi, I'm Stacy Rogers, Snag Board President. And Thank I'm Marianne Rosner, Managing Director. All right, we are so excited to begin the first of this annual symposium series that explores the deep and continual flow of international ideas in contemporary jewelry and metalsmithing. As we will focus on a different geographical region each year, this year we begin with the celebration of the diversity of Eastern Asia here and abroad. And we'd like to start by thanking our incredible Aki Ho Yoon, Yin Chi Puffy Zhao, and Carrie Ann Quick. You've all gone above and beyond to see this program through, and we cannot express our appreciation enough. We'd also like to extend a special thanks to Mitoko Furuhashi, Bifei Tsao, Patricia Medea, and Shiran Zhou. I'd also like to thank Stacy Rogers for all her hard work with this and all of SNAG's programming areas. Her commitment to her role as president is evident, and we are lucky to have such a dedicated person in this position. Thanks, Brian, and I would like to thank you for your passion and enthusiasm for SNAG and its community. I'm so grateful to you for all your dedication and the time you spent developing and organizing this symposium. I'm so excited to be a part of it the next couple of days. I appreciate you so much, and I'm so thrilled to have you as our managing director. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And we'd also like to thank our sponsors. Oh, yeah. And, <laughs> and now we'll tell you um, a little bit about how this is going to work. So over, the, over the next few days, we'll have a mix of presentations, demonstrations, participatory discussions, and just getting to know to get each other, getting together in this virtual space. For each theme presentation program, our moderator will introduce and play each video in the main stage. The presentations are all pre-recorded to avoid connectivity issues, provide captions, translations, and for making this entire process more accessible for our international artists. Following each set of presentations, you're invited to join a conversation with any of the presenters who are available to join live and a guest moderator over in the session. We hope these topics and incredible artists inspire a rich discourse. And we'll make all the recordings of each session available in the replay area. And we'll be extending the hop in event through the end of Sunday so that you can continue to watch the recordings through the weekend on this platform. And then on Monday, you'll receive an email with links for access to the recordings for a month. If you have any questions anytime during this event, someone should be available to assist you in the SNAG support, support ses session. <laughs> That's a lot of S's. So now, without further ado, let's introduce you to our symposium moderator, Alex Darby. Alex is a speculative jeweler and entrepreneur. We got to get her. Oh, there she is. Oh. She there's Alex. Alex. Hi, Alex. Hey, I'll start Alex. Nice to see you both and great to be here this morning. Uh, thank you for having me as your moderator and welcome everyone to the first of many symposiums at SNAG. Awesome, welcome. Well, uh, Stacey was gonna, we'll tell you a little bit more about Alex and then yeah. we will sign off and not get in the way anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Alex is a speculative jeweler and entrepreneur. She brings a unique perspective to the world of jewelry through a digital lens. She'll offer insight, information, and context through a welcoming and participatory approach to digital space, building connectivity for our community throughout this online experience. Thank you so much, Alex. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. So we'll, we'll, we'll let Alex take over, and we hope to see you in the sessions and in uh, the chat and everywhere this weekend. So, yep. Bye. Enjoy, everyone. Okay, folks. Well, welcome, welcome. Some of you may recognize me from the SNAG conference uh, earlier in the year, but if we have not met yet, my name is Alex Dobby. I am an interdisciplinary artist, a strategist, producer, and entrepreneur, and I work across art, tech, culture, 
and entrepreneurship. I am the creator and curator of The Jewelry Phone, which is a speculative jewelry platform, and also the founder of Darby Studios, an interdisciplinary studio that supports creative practice and early stage businesses. And you may also know me as the director of digital at New York City Jewelry Week. Um, I'm going to be with you for the next two days. I'm very excited for the program that is coming up. We've got some amazing artists and some amazing presenters. Um, and I'm going to kick things off by introducing our first presenter for today. Now, let me just add this over here. Okay, so our first presentation for today is a Makume Gane a demonstration with Anne Wolf. Uh, Anne earned her Masters of Fine Art in Jewelry and Metals at San Diego State University and has taught Jewelry and Metals at Southwestern College in Chula Vista, California for 10 years. She's been working with Makume Gane since 2007, studying with and learning from many masters in the field, including James Binion, Ford Hallam, and Hiroko Sato Pijanowski. She creates custom Makume Gane wedding rings, jewelry, vessels, and boxes, and her patterning techniques range from chisel to stamping and twisting, drawing inspiration from the complex patterns and texture found in nature. Her work has been shown across the US and in venues such as the Deutsche Goldschmidt House in Hanau, Germany, and the Tsubame Industrial Materials Museum in Japan. It is my great pleasure to welcome Ann Wolf here today. Welcome, Ann. <laughs> Anne, <laughs> I see you there. <laughs> hey, sorry. I sorry. I thought we were going to go straight into my presentation. I didn't realize we were going to do a live, anything live. Oh, I'm very sorry. Uh, I'll uh, kick that over right now. But uh, welcome, and I'll just uh, okay. Here I am, guys. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Hello, welcome everyone. I'm so pleased to be here at uh, SNAG's virtual fall symposium. And um, my name is Anne. I'm here to talk to you about Mokume and to actually demonstrate some Mokume techniques. Um, I shorten it, Mokume Gane is the full word, means wood grain metal in Japanese, but we'll get into all of that. Uh, so pleased to be here with you. It's going to be a really fast uh, 30 minutes and then there should be some time for discussion at the end. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and get things set up and sorted here. All right. All right, here we are. Um, so uh, like I said, I'm going to be doing some demonstrations, but I do want to talk to you a little bit about some history as well. Uh, I've been doing Mokume for um, what seems like a long time now, um, since 2007. Uh, and it certainly has been a technique that grabbed my attention and uh, changed the course of my life when I uh, started getting into it. And I hope to uh, show everyone today the uh, diversity of patterns that can be created. I think it often gets um, thought of as a sort of a one-off thing. You learn how to do it in school maybe, uh, and you sort of drill some holes in your mokume and you make some patterns and there you go. Um, but really, I, I would like to show, if anything, coming away from this um, little talk and demonstration that with some practice and some creativity, you can make Mokumegane a tool for in your toolkit that is something that you can create completely unique patterns that are really a hallmark of a particular artist rather than something that is a paint by numbers uh, kind of a thing. So the background here that you're looking at right now is actually a, a sample uh, that I did of one of my patterns and uh, yeah, I'll can continue on here. So first off, I would want to say just a few little words about uh, the history of Mokume Gane. Uh, it's here in a symposium that's focusing on Eastern Asia. And so um, we need to recognize it was first invented in Japan in the 1600s in the Edo period. And we're looking at two examples of sword fittings here that use Mokume Gane. The one on the big round guy is the suba or sword guard. The sword itself goes right through the middle there. And uh, you can see its name, Mokumegane, literal translation is wood, wood eye metal. We 
usually translated as wood grain, because the patterns can look a lot like wood grain. And in this suba or sword guard that you see, we certainly see that. And then, then the, the smaller uh, uh, skinny, long skinny piece on the right, I just include because it's one of the earliest pieces of Mokamegani that we've figured out. It's um, made by Shwami Denbe and um, in the middle 1600s. Uh, it's uh, uh, really great to see something that old that could have been made honestly by a Mokume artist um, just last week. So, uh, so the, 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 there's some of the beginnings. I could go much more into history uh, and how it moved from Japan to the U.S., how we, how secrets were lost, secrets were found again, all that sort of stuff. But we don't have time to go into all of that. Maybe in another talk, another time. So. Um, rather than uh, talk more about history, let me just say a little bit about what it is and what we're talking about so that you can follow along when we do the when we do the patterning demonstrations. First off, mokumegane is a technique. It's not a material. It's a technique of layering different colors of metal or different alloys or even just one color, but that would be a bit silly. Um, together and fusing them with time, heat and pressure, but no solder. So the image you're looking at here is me uh, working down a billet. That's what we call it when we take the stacks of metal, a bunch of squares. In this case, it was a one by two square um, squares of metal stacked up copper and nickel and then fused with time, heat and pressure. There are lots of different ways to do that. If we had more time, I would go into the, all the geeky details of solid state diffusion bonding versus liquid state diffusion bonding and the pros and cons of both. But for now, let's just say this was fused um, uh, with time, heat, and pressure. And now I'm working it down to consolidate the layers and make sure they stick together when I start to work the material. So you can clearly see the layers on here um, along the sides of the, the different layers of copper nickel. If we look at it from the top, it wouldn't be interesting because there's just one layer showing, right? So as we're going through the patterning, keep in mind what's going on is that what we need to do with Mokamegane is somehow deform those layers and then usually uh, remove parts. So deform and abrade are the, the two words I'll use often. Um, so deform like um, uh, move the metal around and then abrade or remove material to reveal the different layers. That's how how the patterns appear in Mokume. And, and that's something to uh, keep in mind when I, when I teach students how to do patterning, that's often the hardest thing is, is to really understand that the pattern is going all the way through the metal. It's not just on the surface. So we can keep that in mind as we, as we go along. So here are some rings. Um, these are some rings that that's one of the things that I do to make a living is to uh, as I make uh, custom Mokumegane wedding rings. And these are all different colors of gold and silver. I don't ever use any patinas on my rings because they would just rub off, right? Um, and this is a very popular application of Mokumegane in the West right now. Uh, but there is so much more that can be done with Mokume. I just show this because um, it is part of what I do, but also um, I want to show you one of the more popular um, types of twisting um, patterns today. Uh, so uh, let's show, uh, but first I'll show you a big variety of twisting patterns. So um, these patterns all start with Mokumegane rod. This would be a, a four, five or six millimeter square with um, anything from 15 to 20 layers of metal um, and twisted and then um, manipulated to make the pattern, um, to reveal a pattern. Um, I would love to geekily go into the details of how I achieved each one of these patterns and what all the different metals are, but we don't have time for that. I just hope that you'll enjoy seeing them and feel free to ask me questions about any one of, ones of them that you, that you like in the live period for questions afterwards. So um, you'll notice the little um, middle one here that I've got my cursor over. This is the one I'm going to show you how to do as my first demonstration. And it of course is called the star pattern. And it's very popular in the US. Um, one uh, one well-established Mokumegane artist, Chris Plouffe, um, uh, kind of derides it as 
as a baby's first mocha may pattern because it's sort of an obvious thing to do. But I think it's valuable to show you um, because it, it, it helps if you do it, it really illustrates what's going on in the metal and you'll understand more spatially how to create more patterns. So, so um, uh, I think it's a, a cool pattern to try and uh, it'll use some uh, tools that you're very familiar with in terms of your own metal work. Okay. So um, here's a pair of rings that I made uh, using this pattern, the star pattern. Uh, I just uh, show that to show an application of what you might do with the pattern after you create it. Uh, but of course, in terms of the sample we'll be doing here uh, for the demo, you won't be making a full ring. It's just going to be a little strip of uh, a star pattern. So um, let's carry on. So again, um, if you want to try this at home, um, isn't that fun? You, um, uh, please do. You'll be able to access this recording if you're here watching it now. Uh, I know that, that Snag will have it available to rewatch later, which you might want to be able to do while you're working in your studio. Uh, I've been teaching online classes uh, since COVID started, so uh, it's been a joy for me to recognize some of the uh, advantages to online classes. And number one of them is certainly being able to record and rewatch. So you want to start with five or six millimeter square rod. Uh, two or three inches is plenty, and it should have 17 to 25 layers. Now I know you're thinking, but wait, I don't know how to fuse Mukimegane. I thought you were going to show us how to do that no time in this particular demonstration to show you all of that. But the good news is you can buy this from um, Reactive Metals, go to their um, website um, and say hi, they're a great small company. And you can buy fairly inexpensive copper and brass uh, um, Mocha Megani rods so that you can try this at home uh, or in your studio. So here we go. Other things you will need, um, a good pair of vice grips, uh, a vice. This is a kind of a smaller vice. I'll show you using a larger vice as well as we go along, but um, it just clamps to the tabletop. Uh, and then on the right here is a piece of annealed uh, Mocha Megane rod. I'll um, stick to the copper brass right now and anneal as normal to a, a, a red that you can see. I would talk more about silver uh, Mokume if I get a chance later. Um, all right, so uh, here we go. Here's our first video. Um, this is a little detail that I'm so pleased to be able to share with folks because there are so many people that contact me via Instagram or my website that um, are trying to twist Mokumegane and it's falling apart. And somehow, somewhere on the web, in the grand interwebs, uh, there are YouTube videos of people doing this hot with, with a torch in the middle here on the metal. Don't do that. It's going to delaminate if you do that. Do this cold. Anneal first, certainly. Twist. And then if you want more twist, anneal, cool, and twist again. Um, I hope that this will be worth the price of admission for some of you folks that might have tried uh, twisting Mokume, um, but doing it hot at the advice of someone on YouTube. Uh, I think that that started up because of people of Mokume Gane's relationship with Damascus steel. And of course, many processes um, with Damascus steel are done hot. The non-ferrous metals really don't like being worked hot and they don't need to be worked hot because they're not steel. Um, you probably would get away with it with copper, brass, nickel, but once you start using silver in your Mokume, it just don't do it hot. It's not going to be good. So here we go. I'm all set up. I've got about a quarter of an inch or six millimeters um, tightly into the vise. Also, I would want to say that the um, I like to squeeze the line, the layers of the metal parallel with the vise and the vise grips. Um, and here we go showing you doing the twisting. It's really pretty easy. Of course, it's going to be easy easier if the rod is narrower, like five millimeter rather than six millimeter and longer like three inches instead of two inches. Here I've done about a twist and a half. I'm showing you guys that. Um, I could go ahead and maybe I could get another half a twist out of there, but I chose to go ahead and, and uh, anneal it at this point. This is just an image of annealing to keep uh, you guys on track. Remember, uh, whenever you're deforming metal, hammering it, putting it through the rolling mill, however, it's going to work harden and you'll want to anneal it. Anneal to a dull red copper brass. It's in a little cave so that I can um, control the, the amount of light. So I'll take, I'll, I'll have my torch, then I'll take the torch out of the cave, 
of fire bricks so that I can really tell if the metal is glowing. You want to be really careful not to overheat mokume when you're annealing it, and you also don't want to quench it. So just let it air cool. All right. Um, here's me uh, going ahead and uh, twisting again. And actually, I've changed my setup a little bit here. And through the magic of, of um, film, I have switched to a different piece of Mokume. This is a shorter and fatter piece, just to show you the difference. So this is six millimeter rod, a two inch piece, copper brass, actually bought from Reactive Metals. Uh, and I'm twisting it a second and even a third time, um, um, anneal, twist, anneal, twist, so that I can get a nice tight twist. So this takes a little more elbow grease because it's a fatter piece and a shorter piece, but still perfectly possible. I switched to this vise actually because it's a little stronger. The one um, that I was using in the previous video was a little wobbly. And um, that's why you know you want to have a nice vice for what you're doing. Uh, here's a, a still image showing us what the same uh, piece of Mokume looks like after two full twists or after three full twists. Of course, a full twist is when your vice grips come all the way back to where you started. And with three full twists, we will get six stars in our final pattern. All right, um, now here we go. I'll start um, this video going. I'm just showing you here um, after the twisting, when your metal is sort of round, but it's got all these um, uh, hills and valleys from the twist itself. So um, you wanna go ahead and forge that to round. Those of you that are quite familiar with forging, if you'd rather forge it square, you can do that too. I don't recommend running it through a rolling mill to make it square because that might be easier, but you're gonna stretch out those twists. You're gonna stretch out those stars and you won't get them nearly as close together. So really hand forging is better than running through the mill at this point. And let's see, I don't think we need to watch me do all of that. This is again, the magic of film, we can just make me hammer really, really fast. And you don't have to make this perfect. You just, it's just going to be a lot easier. The next steps are going to be a lot easier if you consolidate those layers and just make it round ish. Doesn't need to be perfect. All right. Um, and then probably anneal again wouldn't be a bad idea. There's just a close up of what that looked like. So you can still see there are some, um, there's still some negative space where my hammer didn't hit, but it doesn't have to be perfect. All right. Um, and now draw a little Sharpie line down the middle. Um, if we looked at this really close, we would see that my Sharpie line on the end crosses the grain. So it's perpendicular to the end grain of the material. When you do that, you'll see what I mean. It'll work the other way, but this way you'll get more stars. And try to keep your line straight. Mine's not really straight. Did the best I could, but try to make a straight line down the middle. This is going to guide you for your next step, which those of you who might have done this before have already guessed. We're going to take this Mokume and we're going to saw it in half. And that's where the stars appear. So grab your jeweler saw. Um, I really wouldn't try this on a bandsaw, folks. Uh, you're going to lose so much material and it's going to be your tiny close. No, just calm down, be zen with one, one with the saw, and you can do it. It's fine. I'll show you the way I'm doing it here is sped up a little bit, but uh, notice how I have it in the vise at an angle. This is going to make it it's easier for me to saw. Notice I'm using lubrication. It's liquid burl life. That's one of my favorite lubrications to use for sawing. And also notice that I'm varying my angle of attack. Right? I don't saw at one direction, at one angle. I tip the saw back, I tip the saw forward. That's gonna help me saw a lot faster. Um, thank you, Chris Kluth. <laughs> He's the one that kind of illustrated um, to me uh, the physics of why that would be better um, than, than trying to stay at the same angle. Now let's go to the second side. Uh, so I saw it in that last video, I saw it about two thirds of the way through. Now I'm turn I've turned it around in the vise and I'm gonna saw through the last third. It actually takes longer to saw through the last third because I need to make sure that um, my lines meet up in the middle. So you need to be fairly precise here. And you'll notice me as I get closer, I'm gonna stop and peer underneath and try and check and make sure um, that my saw has stayed straight up and down and I'm sawing through the center of the material. It's pretty easy to go off to the left or the right a little bit. And that means that your saw lines won't much match up exactly. 
one thing you might notice when you're watching this video that will help you is that I was sawing uh, with both my hands. Your piece is in the vise, take one hand and then just grab the other, grab your dominant hand with your non-dominant hand and, and just saw together. It'll help you become more ambidextrous and it will help keep your saw straight up and down instead of listing to one side or the other. And here's what it looks like when you are almost through. You can see, or you're, I mean, basically it was through. I think I had to wiggle a little bit to get it to come loose. But right through here is where it met up. It didn't meet up perfectly because I'm not perfect, but it's not bad. Uh, and now I'll show you this is what happens when I wiggled it, broke it open. And we've got some little funny bits here. You can take those off with a file. Um, don't just hammer, don't just forge them down. You want to take them off because they're, they're little burrs. Um, so some filing, some sanding disc, and you'll see what you see here. In fact, the bottom one here is uh, I used a sanding disc first to make things kind of smooth out. The top one, I did not use a sanding disc. I just did some quick liver of sulfur on here. And you can see the bottom one has a little tighter pattern, a little cleaner lines. And that, that's recommended to do that. You, you clean that up with a sanding disc before you do any forging. But the next thing you could do is some forging. So you see this two inch, this is a two inch piece of six millimeter square rod when I started and one side I've chosen to forge down a little more flat you can see that the one I did not forge stayed at about two inches but the one that I did forge got about a quarter almost half an inch longer and um yeah from there on let your imagination take you this was copper brass um you could do it with any kind of of mokume um and then uh form solder fabricate as usual, All right. Um, so that was our that was our first one. And uh, gosh, we're at twenty minutes. We've only got ten minutes left. So uh, I'll try to be a little bit faster for the for the second one. We'll see how this goes. But um, now that was rod patterning rod. So I want to show you patterning some sheet. But first, I'm just showing you an image of a vessel of mine that I made. Uh, January 2020, I believe, and um, one of my favorite pieces and larger pieces uh, using pattern sheet. Um, in this case, the pattern sheet is done with chisel patterning and then a little bit of stamp patterning, um, but there are lots of ways to pattern sheet. And here's a little close up of the uh, lid open. And then here's some cl a close up of just the Mokume itself. Um, this Mokume is silver, Kuro Shibuichi, and copper. Uh, Kuro Shibuichi is a Japanese alloy of silver and copper. And let's see where we are here. Just going to the next slide. All right. Um, before we dive into the specific patterning demonstration for sheet, um, I'm just showing you another some more examples of patterning. These are all uh, samples that I've made. None of them have turned into finished pieces yet, but uh, I just wanted to show uh, again the diversity of patterning of patterns that you can make with this technique. Uh, we're looking at a lot of different metals, a lot of different Japanese alloys, um, and different patterning techniques. Uh, the top um, left one here is done with chisel patterning. That's the most traditional Japanese way of patterning. The one down here is also on the bottom right is also chisel patterned, but then with a little bit of drilling and a little bit of round burr, um, and then forged back flat. Basically is how that's done. Bottom left is done by uh, pushing basically um, uh, steel wire and steel stamps into the top surface of the metal while I'm on steel, while I'm on an anvil. Um, and then this one on the top right, this is the one that I want to show you. Uh, it's very satisfying, especially if you work with a hammer a lot in your own um, metals practice, uh, because it's really quick and direct. So it's basically, I call it direct hammer patterning. Um, and um, so that's what I'll show you. All right. So what you want to start with is uh, 14 gauge or um, uh, excuse me, 16 gauge metal, about 1.3 millimeters. Um, and it, it could be it could be 16 or 14 gauge, and the number of layers could vary. Um, again, if, if you're making your own Mokume, go for it, create, design your layer stack, make as many layers as you want. If you are ordering your Mokume sheet from somewhere like Reactive Metals, then um, they have some really uh, reasonable uh, copper brass sheet Mokume um, that's um, 
uh, 14 gauge, I believe, but you can use that. And this is a one by two inch sample. Um, in this is part of a larger demo. I actually patterned the other side and then um, uh, continue, continued on and patterned the other side. But here we're just going to pattern one half of it. And the other half is just a convenient handle. So I'm going to be using a cross peen hammer. You can see it there in the foreground. Um, any kind of hammer that has a small footprint will work. So you could use a cross peen or you could use an embossing hammer with a tiny little point. Um, experiment with that and see uh, see what happens. So here we go, starting with the video. And um, on my hearing protection. I also like to show the way I was hammering. You want you don't want to keep your thumb on the anvil. Get your thumb off the anvil in case you miss. Uh, when I'm teaching students, I don't want to have to interrupt the class with a trip to an emergency room or anything. Um, and uh, that one little bit of keeping your um, thumb off the edge of the anvil will help so much in terms of the pain if you do happen to miss. So uh, I'm just creating a little flow as I'm going along here, and I'm I'm hitting deeply. The whole point here is 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 deforming the surface. Imagine that that sheet. Remember, it has as many layers as I showed you at the beginning there. That that copper nickel billet. They're just very very thin each. So what we're doing is we're we're deforming those top layers. We're making a surface like choppy seas. Um, so they're going little hill, hills and valleys. Um, is what we're making here with the cross peen hammer. So you want to hit hard and, and hit like you mean it, a slightly overlapping blows, but you don't want to go at it so, so much that you expand it too much, that you forge it out. You want to leave those hills and valleys. And here's a close up of that. So, so hills and valleys. So the point is, is the top surface of that has that disruption. And now we're going to take a file and take that disruption off with the file. So um, in order to make that a little bit easier, I'm going to use um, a wooden hammer, wooden rounded hammer, and a little depression in my stump and make that flat piece a little rounded, a little convex on the um, hammered side. This is so that I can access it with the file easier. There are lots of other ways to do this, but this is how I do. So now, uh, since I've gotten that piece is slightly, you can see it's slightly convex, and I'm locking it into a hand vise. That's just to make it easier to hold. I love these hand vises. The uh, uh, technical term, I think, is low pattern hand vise, but you can get them from Micromark. Uh, too much, and they're very handy. Um, so here I am. I'm using a real rough file. Honestly, you, any, any kind of rough file that you might find in your garage would work here. You don't want to use your, your, your nicest Swiss and German files. So you want to use a nice rough cut file. And the most important thing is, as you're filing, maintain that curve. You made a curve with your wooden mallet and your, your gapping block. You wouldn't use a wooden gapping block as well. And maintain that curve. Don't file that curve off. Don't file a facet or a flat spot because then you're going to go too deep in that one area. You want to take a, a consistent amount of your choppy seas off the layers that are going like this so that you're digging down in and revealing the layers below. If you file too much here, you'll go through all the choppiness, you go through all the deformation that you made with your hammer, and you'll get back to one layer. That's a lot of work and not much return. So, um, so know when to stop. I'll show a still image here of where I stopped, and you'll be able to see. I think you get the idea now. Do 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 do. There's the end. Great. And let's have a look. So here is how it looks after filing. You can see all those really rough file marks, but also notice that there are still some places where you can see your hammer blows. Those will turn into a slightly larger copper area because you haven't taken any material away. So the pattern hasn't started to change at all. Watch for those when you see the piece annealed. Okay. Um, the next thing I'll do is um, rather than I could hand sand it, but you know, I've got a lot to do. So um, these little sanding discs, I love these things. I consider them a halfway point between a file and hand sanding. So I'll often use a file, then the sanding discs, and then hand sanding. Um, and um, these are the ones I like the most, the aluminum oxide um, plastic backed. 
So this is after using the sanding disc and you can see, um, just barely start to see some of the uh, copper and brass patterning in there. But now, check it out, oops, hello. Um, here is what it looks like with, uh, after I've annealed. So um, that is just how, that's just from my filing, that pattern that, that came up. I'll also show here, um using liver of sulfur this is fun just to see well i'm going to fast forward through a little bit because you don't really need to see me mix the liver of sulfur i added a little bit of ammonia now i'm going to dip it in and i should be wearing gloves i debated whether i should clip this and show this to snag sometimes i'm bad and i don't wear gloves but you should um and you can watch the pattern appear how cool is that um that that's uh, one of the aha moments when I teach my Mokume patterning classes that people actually get to see their, their pattern appear. So the one that the piece the sample that we're looking at is the one I patterned on the left, but you didn't see me pattern the right hand side of it. We didn't have time for that, um, but you could learn how to do that uh, another time. So um, let's see, I think that we should move right along. We are close to our 30 minutes, unfortunately, but here is uh, another Suba. And I'm sharing this with you because um, it's a pattern that has sort of intrigued and frustrated Mokume artists for many years, throughout the ages, one could say. And um, my Mokume mentor, Earl Bushy, and I have been kind of working on how to do it, how to recreate it. We aren't the first ones to be playing around with that, but um, that's part of the fun of Mokume is, is, is researching the patterns and figuring, um, backwards figuring it out, how the particular Mokume artist did them, and then using that to create our own work. So that's not a stopping point. It's not an end point. It's... Um, uh, learning a new technique and then applying it and making it our own. So um, so here are just, a, just the, this is uh, just me showing my process. I don't have any, any videos, but um, do you see here on the upper left, all of these marks are just that direct hammer mark. That's what those are. Just went in and did the direct hammer. This is not copper brass, Mokume, of course. And then um, I used a steel stamp tool, made one that was sort of cherry blossom shaped um, and stamped it really deep. All right, this is, those of you that have taken classes with me, I, I encourage you to take this and run with it because I've never actually shown this process at all to any of my classes, um, so I was just kind of figuring it out, but I don't wanna be that sort of artist that holds secrets tight and, and not doesn't share them with people. Um, I feel like the more we share with each other about our processes, the more we each will learn and, and get better. And then it just feeds off each other. And it's, it's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. So, so those of you that um, uh, can see how to do this, take it and run with it. Um, the steel, the stamp tool was done after the hammer stamp, right? I stamped them quite deep. So here you're seeing the surface after I've filed and after I've used the sanding disc. I have never touched those areas with the cherry blossoms. They were pushed so, so far down that that top layer remains. Right? And this is what that looks like just after annealing. You can still see, I think in this number three image, how the, the cherry blossoms are still pushed back. They're pushed down a little bit, but I like the pattern. So now I'm done. So then I go ahead and forge it flat and then send it through the mill a bit. And I have a patterned piece that's really quite similar to the cherry blossom of old. Um, and uh, here is uh, a slide of more research along those technical lines. This is a close up of that, of that cherry blossom suba from the Edo period that I showed you just two slides ago. And then here's my uh, another sample that I did with uh, silver copper and Kuro Shibuichi. And here is my friend and mentor Earl um, doing the same thing, but instead of cherry blossoms, he's going for ginkgo leaves and koi. And so I got permission to show that uh, from him. And uh, I think it's just really exciting, the research um, that is going on back and forth in a, a sort of a small world of Mokume in that's a subculture of Mokume that's within the metals world. But uh, there's so much potential for expressive pattern development with this technique that I really um, encourage you to um, 
do more research. Uh, I've, I've showed you a bunch of books here because I'm old school that way and a bunch of names because I know all that you really need to do is, um, you know, type those names into your Google search and you'll find a plethora of information. So Masaki Takahashi, he wrote the textbook of Moku Megane. It's available in English now, which is extremely useful and wonderful. Uh, James Binion is a giant of the field. Um, and along with Chris Plouffe, they do a lot of work together. Uh, Chris Plouffe has some free papers that you can find um, by Googling Chris Plouffe Santa Fe Symposium um, and Mokume Gane, and you'll get some really good information on how to make your own Mokume. Steve Midget, of course, wrote a really comprehensive book. And most of that book, unfortunately, the book is out of print, but you can download it and see parts of it for free on his website. And uh, Ian Ferguson also wrote a book. Unfortunately, it's out of print. You see a bit of it right here. Philip Baldwin is actually the maker of the Mokume that you buy from Reactive Metals. Um, and Ford Hallam is someone, if you are um, drawn to Japanese metalwork, the aesthetics, the fine craftsmanship, the tradition, then I, I, I highly recommend you look up uh, Ford Hallam and um, you can learn so much from his Patreon channel and uh, even just his uh, free videos on YouTube. It, will really, it really helped me become a better uh, craftsperson um, and uh, something to shoot for. So, um, so there you go. Those are some research for future. And uh, if you'd like to look up more about me, you can find me on Instagram at Anvil Studio and uh, also my website, anvilstudio.com. So thank you so much for um, being here for this talk. And uh, those of you that are here live, I would love to answer some questions. So um, I'm going to go ahead and end this uh, recorded broadcast and be uh, looking forward to answering your questions live. Thanks so much. What a great presentation. We're going to welcome Anne now. So if you have questions, please post them in the chat or in Q&A, and we can level them up. But I saw a lot of chatter already in the chat, Anne, about this philosophy on sharing your secrets and bringing them to everyone. I couldn't agree more. That's such an amazing perspective to have, and not one that is uh, as common as it should be. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it is hard sometimes to um, to get into that mindset because um, we work so hard to uh, research and, and uh, discover things. Um, and uh, sometimes it's easy. Um, I use a, a lot of uh, uh, philosophy from what I learned from my yoga teacher as well, and he calls it being grabby. So, you know, if you grab on to something and then it's only yours, um, but if you can let it be free, then the, the benefits are, are, are multifold for, for everyone, right? You, you, all, you all learn more. So, uh, yeah, it's hard to do that sometimes, but I think it's really valuable. Yes. He might want to come up with a different description for what that's called. I don't know if being grabby is the best. <laughs> well, you don't want to be grabby, right? So it's a bad thing. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe sticky is a good one. <laughs> um, yeah, I just, you know, I really love this perspective, particularly when you're dealing with something as, you know, detailed and um, specific and historical that's kind of coming from a different place that, you know, there is a lot of research involved. There is a lot of process development, not just in terms of what has come before you, but for your own work uh, within that space. Um, uh, is there anything else that you'd like to share about your process specifically or something maybe that you have learned that uh, is a diversion from your kind of historical research into this? Uh, well, let's see. While, while the um, uh, video was running, of course, I thought of all the things I was supposed to that I wanted to say that I forgot. This and is my, chance. <laughs> my second chance. Um, so I just have to say, for those of you that do try uh, the sawing, the, the making the star pattern and sawing in half, Use a big blade, okay? Don't get your the 4-0 blade out that you were using to saw your 20 gauge metal. Uh, get like a number four or something, a large blade to go through. So, um, uh, gosh, what else um, to say? Um, uh, I didn't get a chance to talk anything about uh, Mr. Uh, Norio Tamagawa. He is one of the masters of Mokumegane that um, actually helped rediscover it. So when I said secrets lost and, and secrets found, um, the making Mokumegane kind of um, uh, fell apart in after the Edo period in Japan uh, because of the um, 
the war, um, uh, the whole um, structure of people, um, uh, craftspeople making the sword furniture fell apart because swords were, were made illegal. Right, in, in, in Japan. And so um, the by the time uh, Norio Tamagawa was working in the 70s, uh, Mokumegani hadn't been done hardly at all. And he, he learned, him, he taught himself from books again. Um, and then uh, one of his students, um, Hiroko um, Sato Pijanowski, was someone who came and brought the technique, uh, who learned from him, and then came and brought the technique to the U.S. And uh, she and her um, husband, Jean, um, uh, taught it to a lot of different students in uh, university uh, art uh, sort of context. And then that got disseminated throughout the U.S. So uh, I was just a little more history. Uh, yeah. Oh, and also, I didn't get to say about um, so many um, I had all this research of contemporary Mokume that didn't make the cut for the slideshow, but uh, uh, go to Instagram and do, uh, you know, the hashtag Mokume Gane, and you will find people from all over the world. Um, there's a fellow in um, uh, South Korea that's doing some really cool stuff. Uh, I can't pronounce his name. <laughs> So you just have to, I hope you guys can, you guys can find him in Brazil, um, the UK, Switzerland. Uh, there's all, all kinds of stuff um, in Mokume happening all over the world. Yeah, that's really exciting. I think you can have re-education and uh, reinterpretation process in terms of like redeveloping, you know, even like historical masters redeveloping uh, this kind of process over and over again, like throughout the time. Um, we have a couple of more technical questions. I think someone had asked about the saw blade, so thanks for mentioning that. Uh, that was a question early on. Um, Lauren says, great presentation. Do you have any suggestions for working with brass when cre creating the initial billet? I often have delamination issues with brass especially. Oh, excellent. So uh, yes, brass, we can get geeky about what kind, of alloy, what kind of brass alloy are we talking about here? Yellow brass or red brass? Um, yellow brass or cartridge brass is a uh, higher content, um, 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 has uh, lower copper content. And so um, it can cause problems definitely with silver. If you're trying to make a billet out of silver and yellow brass, that's definitely going to be a problem. Use red brass instead. Other words for red brass are jeweler's brass or Merlin's um, Merlin's gold, something like that. Um, and so it uh, has the higher copper content, um, makes it so that there won't be um, a eutectic form between the yellow brass and the silver, which actually forms solder at higher temperatures. So you can get into real trouble if you're doing yellow brass and silver, I don't recommend that. Um, if she's talking about just a base metal, uh, brass with copper or brass with nickel, there really shouldn't be a problem, but of course the temperature should be higher. So if you're fusing a billet that has uh, silver in between each layer, you should be using a lower temperature. If you're using uh, a fusing a billet that has only base metals like copper, brass, and nickel, you should be fusing at a higher temperature. So. <laughs> I hope you got all that down, Lauren. You'll have to come back to the video and replay. <laughs> um, we have a question from Schaffen, which is, what is the press that you're using in the demo? Oh, sure. I'm using a Mark III uh, uh, Bonnie Dune press from Rio Grande. Um, it is only a 20 ton um, and, and it has the it has what I call the, the magic pushy button, right? So you don't have to, you're, it's not a manual press. You don't have to uh, clank it, um, uh, crank it. And you really don't, um, you really can't fuse Mokume with just a manual press. You got to get an electric one. Um, and so that that's probably one of the pricier pieces of equipment in my shop, but it's still a smaller one. Um, um, you can only really do maybe a one and a half by two inch billet. That would be the maximum you could do with that size press. Um, but, um, you know, I'm, I, I lust after a, a hundred ton. I will get one <laughs> at some point. One day. Um, we have another question from Cynthia. Can you tell us roughly how big in diameter is the cherry blossom stamp that you made? Oh, that's a good question. I think it's about um, a three by five millimeters. Oh, wow. So, yeah. Cool. And, and uh, the larger the stamp is, the more oomph, you know, the, the heavier you got to hammer it. Um, it also needs to have a nice, fairly flat bottom, but yet you don't want the edges of the stamp to be too sharp. So it, I'm still fine tuning all of that. And so that's why another reason why there wasn't a video for that, or I didn't show that stamp tool, because I'm still figuring out exactly um, if the, how sharp the edges should be. And um, actually the walls of the stamp shouldn't be straight up and down. 
they should have a slight, slight angle to them. Mm. Um, great, this is all so great. I'm learning so much. The people who know me already, you know that I'm the lazy metalsmith and I never bothered with any of these kind of techniques. <laughs> so yeah, I'm learning things as well. Um, a question from Christy, what book would you recommend for learning more about the secrets being lost and found? That's a great question, Christy. Thanks. Uh, oh, I, I would go straight to Masaki Takahashi's book, um, The Art of Mokume Gane. It's so wonderful that it's available in English now. Um, and I hope it is still because I think it was about a year ago that I got my copy uh, just on Amazon. Google those, just, just type those words in, you should find it. I've got four copies of it now. Um, because it, for a long time it was only in Japanese, so I would just get it and, and you know stare at the pictures. Uh, <laughs> but um, but it's uh, it tells a lot about the history of Mokume, and he actually goes through his own recreation of that cherry blossom suba, but he does it a little bit differently than 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 Earl and I did. Uh, that's great. So many great questions. I'm just checking here to see if I've missed anyone. Oh, we have a new one from Spencer. Thanks, Spencer. Do you know if the Edo Japanese use solder in their process? Uh, Tiffany's did in the 1880s. Do you know the original process? Yeah, the original process had no solder. That's definitely the Japanese doing that. And and they actually, um, they, were, they were using, see, I can go as geeky as you guys want. Uh, the Japanese were using, um, it, the, the traditional way of fusing was the liquid state diffusion bonding method. So they, were, they would generally use copper and silver only because copper and silver together form this lovely um, uh, physics thing that happens um, when you uh, put copper and silver close together and heat it up at a particular temperature, the um, a eutectic alloy is formed between the copper and the silver layers. So, um, you know, you've got the melting temperature of uh, copper over here at 18 something, you've got the melting temperature of silver over here at 16 something. Together, the two form a eutectic that melted a lower temperature, 1432, I believe. Um, and so that's crazy, right? You know, how does, that's just it's like the magic of, of science. Um, but what that means is um, when um, the Japanese traditionally bonded mokume is heated a little hotter maybe than it needed to, um, um, you get a eutectic layer. And so that's a, a new alloy that forms between the copper and the silver. And sometimes when um, uh, people were looking back at these older um, uh, Mokumegane pieces, they would see that eutectic layer and mistake it for solder. But it wasn't. It, it was a eutectic formed between the copper and the silver. So yeah, traditionally there was no solder used. And I do know about that about Tiffany and even some, you know, uh, uh, Mokume today, um, it's not really Mokume if it has solder uh, in between the layers. Yeah. Mic drop. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a follow-up question to that question from Kristen, which is asking, when you say silver, do you mean fine silver or an alloy? And I know there's some other questions, I'll get to those, but that was a follow-up to what sure. you said. Sure. Yeah, certainly the Japanese would have been using fine silver. And and that's something um, I still I still can't quite let go of my sterling. Um, I, 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 I do use sterling silver instead of fine silver um, because I like the strength of the sterling. Uh, but of course, you've got all the fire scale issues. Um, I'll say also um, uh, anticipating perhaps a question down the line is argentium silver. I, I haven't had much luck infusing argentium silver um, because it does weird things at black heat. Um, and so uh, you're on your own for that if you try <laughs> fusing with argentium. Um, but and also it is soft. So so I stick with sterling um, as my silver, but the Japanese do not are, don't, are not keen on, on sterling. They're generally using either fine silver or sometimes 950. Um, so just a 5% a copper. Um, this is great. This is, you know, super nerd alert to start the morning. I'm Why not? because we're all secret scientists over here in the jewelry world. Um, two questions from Chapin, which uh, one is a preference question and one is a technical question. Uh, what do you like more, torch fired versus kiln? And then technical question is, do you have any tips for working with palladium in your life? 
Okay, sure. Um, uh, uh, Jeff, and that's great. I know we've, uh, I think we've talked on Instagram, so it's great to, to get questions from you um, live. Um, so yes, um, first off, oh, there was the Palladium and then, oh, I'm sorry, repeat the first, the, what was the first thing you asked? Uh, it was your preference between torch fire versus kiln. Sure. Oh, so, you know, so torch fired is going to work for sm small billets. It's a great way to learn how to fuse Mokume, but if you want to do it larger billets or you want to actually make a living uh, with Mokume, you're, you're going to need to move away from, from torch firing. Um, um, so, so I'm actually going to consider the question as, um, um, uh, forge fired. So using a propane fired forge rather than electric kiln, I think that's a better uh, uh, co comparison um, because the torch is fire, right? Is live fire as opposed to just the boring electric thing. Um, and of course the live fire is more fun, you know, um, uh, and you also, that's going to be liquid state. You're going to get some of that uh, interstitial um, uh, eutectic alloy forming. And that makes its own beautiful pattern sometimes in the Mokume. It's more traditional Japanese. And so, yeah, it's lovely, but um, I don't do it that way because it, it's not repeat. It's not as repeatable or as safe. And uh, most of my billets, if you certainly if you speak about the amount of money I spend on each billet, um, uh, when I fuse a gold billet, I'm not going to do it with the torch um, or, or in a forge. I, I'm going to put it in my electric, in my Paragon kiln and set the temperature because I, I want it to be perfect. I don't want it to fall apart. So, so yeah, one's more romantic, one's more practical. Oh, and, and great, uh, great answer. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> romantic or are you going to make money? Well, which is it going to be? <laughs> Uh, um, and then the follow-up was the palladium question. Sure. So um, palladium uh, can be a little tricky because it is, um, it needs to be annealed quite frequently. Um, and ideally we would anneal it at a higher temperature, but with Mokume, you have to pay attention to the temperature of the lower melting uh, you know, layers. So, so you can't go annealing it at, at palladium temperature because you'd melt your silver. So let's talk about a, um, a, something I do often, a palladium 500 and silver together, a billet like that, or maybe a palladium 500 and 18 karat gold. For, for both of those, they should fuse the same, but when you're working them down, um, I think of the palladium as short. It doesn't, it, it, it's, it's tight. It doesn't want to move as, as freely as or easily. So you just need to treat it really gently. Um, so for instance, when I'm rolling, um, uh, even when I've got it to the point where I'm trying to get into square wire and I'm taking it through my mill, I would, I, I, I uh, throttle things back by half, you know, I'll turn it an eighth of a turn down each time instead of a quarter turn, um, and, and, and anneal twice as often. Um, because if you don't, it, it can just rip apart. Uh, and that's just because of the nature of palladium, but, um, it's a beautiful metal. Um, and thank goodness it's coming down in price a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. so <laughs> it was really scary there when it was at uh, $2,900 an ounce. Um, but um, but yeah, it's a, it's it's a great metal to be used for precious metal mokume because it's a nice dark gray and you don't have um, any reactivity with it because it's a precious metal. Um, okay, we're coming up on time. We've got time for one more question, and then we're going to have to move on to the next program. Um, I have a question from Kay, which is: Do you scrape clean your layers before assembling? Do do I what clean? Scrape. Scrape clean. Okay. Um, sure. Well, um, I'm not sure about uh, scraping, but I can tell you my cleaning process. Um, I use um, Scotch Brite and Simple Green, um, and and I don't wear gloves. <laughs> I get. I, I'm. Um, uh, I get, uh, think Mokume makers often get um, a little bit um, superstitious. Like there was one time I was with my glove. I was wearing gloves and. My, my Mokume was falling apart. I was like, what is it? Why is it falling apart? Took my gloves off and it's been fine since. So I don't know. Um, but yeah, my fingers get really clean when I'm scrubbing my billets, as you can imagine. They just, um, so I don't do any denatured alcohol. I just think that's, I just think that's a waste of time, honestly. Um, Scotch Bright and Simple Green. Um, and um, I have a three, three tray system. There's a tray of distilled water that they come out of, then they go in a rinse, then Scotch Bright and Simple Green, both sides, dip in rinse water, and then a holding tank um, with water and a tiny bit of citric acid pickle to keep any oxidation um, uh, coming back, um, to clean off any oxi oxidation that forms. 
Amazing. Okay. That's about all we have time for on the questions. Some fantastic knowledge there. Thank you so much, Anne, for sharing your wonderful demo presentation and all of this insight. It truly really is so valuable to the community to be able to have a touch point with you and hear from you. And, uh, you know, I know I've learned a lot. I think all these folks uh, who are joining us have as well. And it's just so great to have you here. Thank you for being here today. Oh, thank you so much. And and I want to say a uh, uh, thanks to um, Diane, Diane Weimer over my shoulder here. I'm actually um, here in her studio this morning. Uh, through the magic of, of the virtual uh, world, I can be teaching a Mechamegani workshop, which I'm right in the middle of, uh, and be uh, talking to you guys around the world. So uh, it was a, a great uh, pleasure talking to all of you. And um, I'll get back to my students over here. And um, I hope to see everyone again sometime. Yes, amazing. Thank you for uh, being such an amazing uh, multitasker, teaching and delivering all of this knowledge all around the world. Thanks so much, everyone. And thank you, Anne. Um, we have